Can, can we, can we have okay, so we're, we're going to get started um, because we, 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 we want to finish the, on time. Can you shift up? Oh, no, there's and, another chair. Uh, oh, there's another. Oh, there's, another. there's no room. We need to call the meeting to order. Uh, people, please, please, we need to get started because we, we, we do want to try to finish on time. Uh, and I just want to uh, uh, tell you the ground rules of this session are a little different. Um, in the other sessions, the, 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 the papers predominate and we took as much discussion as we had time for. And here it's the opposite. The, the papers will be interspersed, paper, the comments, what we hope to have is a mix of questions about different sessions, comments from the audience, uh, interspersed with pithy overview comments by uh, people who have thought a lot about um, this topic uh, in general. And, and not necessarily related to any of the, the, the topics. And I, one of the things we're going to do is probably go back in reverse order uh, in the order of, uh, of questions that we'll take, uh, uh, um, starting with the last session and working, working back. And some of you have questions that, uh, or, or uh, points of view that you want to get across, we may even take them out of order. So I'd like to just first open with uh, calling for some questions, comments on the last session since it's freshest in our mind, the commentators are, are spread around, but I'm sure they can respond wherever they're seating. Yes? I have a couple of questions that I'll try and... Could you identify yourself? I'm Joe Karaganis from the Social Science Research Council. Thank you. I have a couple of questions that I'll, I'll, I'll just summarize quickly. Uh, the, the first has to do with what I take to be the kind of best case version of how the traditional knowledge is regulatory infrastructure plays out. Uh, I mean, accepting David Lang's benign neglect version of this, which I like, but it doesn't seem to be the direction things are going in. Um, and it, it, it looks to me that the best case involves the emergence of a kind of cultural management bureaucracy for every group that identifies itself as having a distinct cultural heritage or body of knowledge to protect. Um, and I'm wondering whether the it, charged with working through a set of issues that makes copyright look simple and transparent by comparison and provides a mechanism basically for adjudicating between developed commercial interests and the indigenous partners without much consideration of how competing claims among indigenous groups might be adjudicated. I'm wondering whether there's any consideration of what kinds of comparative issues would, uh, would, would, would settle a dispute about Two groups that had the same formula for preparing curry with curry powder. All right. Uh, and, and then the, the second question, just as an adjunct to that, is: Is there a shelf life to these issues? Uh, is there? A, I'm sorry. Is there a shelf life to these issues? What does the tr the TK <coughs> debate look like 20 years from now? Uh, uh -huh. All right. Uh, two very interesting questions. Let's get a, two, a, two or three more on the table. Uh, Shubha go. Yeah. Okay. I had a question about um, sort of taking apart some of the TK issues. I mean, we, we we've sort of framed it as an as an IP issue, and I think it is from a defensive posture, but it seems like from a from an offensive posture, which we're playing offense and trying to solve some of these collective action problems, it might be useful to look at other paradigms. It seems like, for example, the just a point that a lot of people made about what does this have to do with innovation? Well, I think it has a lot to do with innovation, but not from the output perspective necessarily, but from the protective inputs that can be used for innovation. And if you're thinking about this as then kind of like labor protection, should we look at union other types of models to try to protect these types of interests. So let's, uh, I guess my question about the non-IP aspects of protecting some of these interests. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, I'm supposed to remind you that uh, you have in front of you a little microphone that's are now on, so that if you shuffle your papers into that little that little black spot, that, that that's all we'll hear. <laughs> so thank you. Okay, let, uh, let's take another one, another question, and we'll let the panel, we have three, go ahead. Uh, Professor Drex. Uh, I was very interested in this aspect of uh, taking into account the cultural implications of traditional knowledge. Uh, I wonder whether we shouldn't include a, a particular uh, international private law approach simply because in the field of traditional IPR protection, uh, IPR protection is based on the principle of territoriality and territoriality as a uh, national treatment it seems to me can't work in this particular field of traditional knowledge. Instead, uh, I think uh, we should uh, adopt rather an approach of universality 
in order to protect uh, traditional law knowledge according to the standards and to the cultural implications uh, from the uh, country, countries of origin. Uh, and uh, uh, the first speaker, I think, mentioned the idea of a mutual recognition. A mutual recognition is very close uh, to the idea of universality. All right, some responses from the panel. Uh, I'm sorry, Professor Evanson, you had one more? Go ahead. Yes, I uh, comment on the uh, genetic resources used in uh, breeding of uh, plant, in plant genetic uh, breeding. Um, the <coughs> principle of, or the, virtually all of the modern breeding work is based essentially on these basic traditional farmers varieties uh, of land races of materials and um, <coughs> they have not been <laughs> subjected to any kind of restricted rights to exclude which after all are what intellectual property rights are uh, and uh, had they been restricted there would have been a very serious impairment of the process of genetic improvement so there's no little question about that in, in terms of Modern race varieties today have uh, breeding lines, have uh, land races from many different parts of the world. Uh, they've, they've been developed over many generations. And, uh, and to have a restrictions on their use would severely impair the process of development of crop variety improvement. All right, so we have a number of, thank you very much, we have a number of, of questions on the table. Uh, let's uh, go, uh, 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 Professor Cotier. Here. Would you like to respond to some of these questions? Well, uh, thank you very much. I, I, I didn't understand the first que set of questions, so I skip these ones. On, on the, um, on the uh, second one, on cultural implication, territoriality, and the mutual recognition, um, I was very much impressed with what Professor Lange said about um, cultural autonomy. And I think the only thing we need to look for is to mechanisms for interfacing uh, different cultures. And uh, I think this would certainly be uh, a, a good idea to, to further explore these things. But it, it, I think it does reinforce the view that we need to have an international system, uh, uh, even though we, we want to uh, recognize the, um, the, the the diversity in, in cultural terms here. Uh, on perhaps on the second question of plant breeding, actually of removing land races uh, out of the public domain and, and attach rights, I think that whether or not you will have these effects will depend on how these rights will be shaped. And um, the basic inequity that you on the top of the layer you actually have these rights in terms of plant variety protection rights or patent rights, but you don't have it. On, on the raw material of this is, uh, is something which uh, I think can be can be solved in a way that you don't have preclusion. Um, for example, if we if, if we uh, limit the exclusive rights, um, go into into modes of compensation. But why uh, why uh, no compensation should be due uh, to communities who cultivate uh, instable land races and uh, uh, while while uh, if you move into genetic engineering. Um, of the raw material, then you have an exclusive right. That's an inequity which has to be solved. Uh, and I'm sure it can be done in a way that we don't have the negative effects of uh, secluding uh, and actually hampering uh, progress. Uh, I think the, uh, in the, in the first you had, I remember one part of your first question was, uh, had to do with uh, conflicting claims between, uh, uh, how are we going to resolve conflicting claims between or overlapping claims with various indigenous groups? Was that, did I interpret yes. that second one correctly? Yes, between indigenous groups, given that they're being forced into a kind of use it or lose it position. Right, and the, f and the, and the first one was? Well, that's, uh, call that one question, and the second was, what does the debate look like 20 years from now? Okay, uh, any comments on that? We, we, okay. Uh, yeah, but, okay, thanks. Um, well, I think on multi, mul multiple claims, I think this will be a matter of uh, setting up the procedures, how these, how they can be sorted out. But the point is, uh, I could, I could perfectly uh, contemplate to see a system where there might be uh, communities uh, in one country A and communities in one country B who would be entitled to the same, to the same uh, uh, plant genetic materials and, and having a sharing, uh, a sharing situation. And in in both 
constellations, I think it would tremendously clarify and improve uh, their negotiations, which we saw uh, an example of, uh, where you don't have clarity on the law, uh, how it works out. Um, I think it, it, it would be possible for both to, to negotiate with these, um, with others, with the industry, with NGOs, uh, uh, if, if it comes to commercial, uh, commercial use. Um, 25 years down the road, um, what I, what I, my, my vision is, if you go to a store, uh, you would you would find uh, a lot of foodstuffs from different countries. Um, you would have labels on it. This is coming from that particular region. This particular region, you would have you would have a choice. Uh, we would have uh, fairly open markets in this, um, and these products would actually then feed back into uh, sustaining uh, the cultural lives of these uh, of these uh, communities here, and. Uh, once we may have these shelves in that way, we may have a legal system in place that supports it here. Uh, but let me just say it's a long way to go, and it's not an issue which is limited to IPRs. It really entails uh, uh, perhaps your other, the other uh, strategies of uh, labor law and, and bargaining, uh, uh, bargaining structures, but primarily also in trade policy. I think trade policy of developing domestic markets for products and then international markets Markets will be an enormous, of enormous importance to sustain um, this movement. Thank you. Dr. Lutfield, uh, any comments on these questions? Um, just a, a pretty, a very poor um, response, but um, it is true that in a lot of cases, uh, knowledge is shared very widely. For example, um, the rosy periwinkle uh, was used uh, to treat diabetes by uh, uh, people in Jamaica and in the Philippines. Uh, the plant itself originated uh, from Madagascar. So the question of who should get uh, the benefits is, 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 is rather an interesting one. Um, in the case of a company called Shaman Pharmaceuticals, uh, which uh -huh. uh, seems to barely exist now, uh, but their policy was to share any benefits uh, uh, um, with all those groups anywhere in the world that agreed to work with them, uh, and regardless of whichever community provided the lead for the particular drug that generated the money. Um, but so I do see some. I do see some role, perhaps, for uh, funds, uh, funding mechanisms of some kind. But uh, um, that's about the best I can do for a, for an answer. Professor Taubman. Uh, thank you. Yeah, uh, I'd like to uh, touch on a number of these points, uh, and indeed um, take up the uh, challenge of Mr. Lang's uh, uh, very persuasive uh, presentation. May, may I ask you to be brief, however, in this instance? <laughs> um, the, and I, it gets to the question of, of the short five years as well. The, the experience is that um, quite a number of uh, communities and, and countries are not only knocking on the door, they're, they're hammering on the door. Uh, there is um, a, a stated need on the part of uh, many people who are actually in this area. Uh, the, um, the international community has been criticised for not taking action rather than preemptively taking action. But at the same time, there is a, um, a, 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 a cyclical psych quality to these issues. Uh, the folklore has been around uh, for, for decades now, and there is uh, a cumulative approach perhaps where uh, experience gained uh, uh, attempts to formalise or codify legal responses and feed back into the, into the process. Um, there's, there's no doubt that uh, any solutions developed in the current phase, if you like, will be found to be inadequate, and that experience will be fed back into future policy making. That gets to the question of are there broader non-IP solutions? Uh, that, that indeed may be the, the outcome of the finding of that process. Um, as, as to the question of uh, overlapping claims, uh, this is an issue not just about uh, ownership of particular items, of, of uh, if you like, a, a, a TK right, but even the problem that um, customary law may transcend uh, national boundaries, that the same um, customary protocols may, may be applicable in different jurisdictions, and that may be recognised in different ways. Uh, so it's not merely the, con the content, if you like, but also the, the legal framework that the traditional law provides. Uh, there are ways of dealing with that. Uh, again, a very, very loose analogy is the geographical indication. Uh, the, the idea of knowledge is geographical indications under Article 23 of the 
um, that points to some way where you just uh, temper your, your expectations of exclusivity to respond to the, the uh, competing rights or the overlapping rights. Uh, I thank you very much. Uh, commentators? Rosemary? Um, uh, just a couple of points. The, the adjudication between communities. Um, <coughs> there's a couple of ways you can think about that. First of all, I think it is important to recognize that indigenous peoples have been working in coalitions, regional coalitions, um, with that have long been recognized um, in other areas, um, for example, within the draft declaration of indigenous uh, peoples, for example. Second of all, I think it's important to recognize that what constitutes a community for the purposes of a traditional knowledge claim um, is not going to overlap. It's not, there are not going to be one set of communities and you're going to ask what knowledge they hold. That, for example, the CBD says traditional knowledge uh, and innovation and practice is held by local communities embodying traditional lifestyles relevant to the preservation of biological diversity. If that's over a huge region, then that's your relevant community. Um, so I don't think that you know the communities are going to be you know a bunch of little graphs because um, for, for all the different purposes of traditional knowledge we're, we're dealing with here, um, I think there is a universalist approach uh, of mutual recognition, and I, I think that's uh, why the um, international uh, cultural rights are significant. Um, I, I think that at some Point, not all traditional knowledge is going to be relevant, protected, uh, or respected simply on cultural grounds. And I think that um, that we, we're some kind of distinctions going to be made there. Um, and the other thing, I guess, about the traditional varieties and land races, um, what I hear often is, OK, yes, if you hadn't had access to these, you couldn't have produced all those food crops. But don't, in exchange, send us crops that we're not allowed to improve upon or breed or develop um, and exchange and share. I mean, you're the ones who are cutting off the, the capacities for improvement with the patent system, with, the, um, with your GMOs and your new technologies. So it, it seems kind of unfair to say, you know, you've contributed all this to this global improvement. Um, and what are we getting back? Um, proprietary technologies, which um, prevent you from from that ongoing work. Thank you. Other commentators? David? Huh. Way late. All right. Um, uh, uh, let me just say in uh, relation to uh, Professor Evanson's point, uh, 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 I, I do believe, I think that the thinking on this field has ev evolved enormously, and it was uh, really gratifying to hear it. I do continue to think that is in so many of these uh, uh, outer edge aspects, uh, compensatory liability rules will save a lot of problems, will solve a lot of problems without harm. And I think the first rule should be primum non nocere, let's do, do any harm. And I don't see how you do any harm with liability rules. I see you do a lot of harm, uh, potential harm with exclusive property rights in this area. And now uh, I'm going to turn to Keith and we'll move into the, uh, 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 this session where we'll intermingle comments and questions. Right. I really just want to uh, introduce uh, a couple of speakers, so let's start with uh, David Vauber, the Reuters Professor of Intellectual Property and IT Law at the University of Oxford. Seven minutes? Seven minutes. Uh, seven minutes, or seven we hope. We'll <laughs> <laughs> try very hard. All right. Now, uh, I'll start with my name, David Vauber. Oh, right, that's all right. Um, so the session is called Balancing Private and Public Interest, so I try and keep my remarks uh, to that, um, and uh, I didn't have a, I didn't pre-write a paper. I just made lots of jottings on this yellow pad that was kindly given to me, and and I've got I think four points to make. My first major theme is um, that I that I've picked up or th that I want to uh, uh, pick up on is uh, that words matter, and that's probably uh, the theme for the four points I want to make. The four points I want to make really are, the, are, are, are these. Firstly, um, we should stop talking about exceptions. Exceptions are rights. The second point I want to make is that strong intellectual property privileges, as you'll see, are we talking about them, are strong only insofar as the public accepts them. Third point I want to make is uh, Beware of too many experts. 
That's a sort of admission against interest. Fourthly, uh, we should not only uh, stop talking about harmonization, uh, we should actually examine, or, or globalization of IP, um, we should actually stop it. <laughs> so let me just uh, elaborate what I mean by, by all those things. Uh, firstly, the point about exceptions or rights, um, and why words matter. We have on the one side, we're talking about balancing things, right? And I think it's important that you balance like against like. Uh, once you concede, on the one hand, that a person has a property right in something, and that what another person has in relation to that is an exception, or an exemption, or a defense, or a privilege, and all those words have been used, then I think you've conceded an enormous amount of ground. And you're not balancing like against like. You're balancing the position of, uh, uh, of master against servant, right holder against petitioner. Uh, Shakespeare was wrong. A rose by any other name doesn't smell as sweet. We call roses uh, Queen Elizabeth's or George Washington's. We don't call them elephant dung. Uh, there is no rose called elephant dung. Um, Exceptions and, ex uh, and privileges are the elephant dung of intellectual property law. I prefer to call them user rights. Then we can start talking about a balancing, balancing the rights, if you wish, of a holder of an intellectual property interest against the rights of people who want to use it. In fact, I, one might have a different strategy. One might be historical about it. We, we, someone was talking about paradigm shift. This is not really a shift. This is really going back, back, back to the future. These things weren't rights at one stage. Even as late as the 19th century, they were called privileges. And some of them were even called personal privileges. Some of them were not assignable. And the reason, and the language matters, because with privilege comes responsibility. You have a right, but you have a right to exercise it, or a privilege, but you have, a, you have, you have an obligation to exercise it responsibly. And perhaps not even uh, do no harm, perhaps affirmatively uh, do good. The golden rule might apply in relation to the way you exercise a right or a privilege, rather than simply uh, saying, I have rights, but all you have uh, is the uh, power to ask me if you can do something. I find it curious that we don't have a three-step test in relation to privileges that uh, 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 IP holders have. I mean, that would be an interesting thing, wouldn't it? We, we, we have to say, for a person who, uh, who's going to use something, you have to uh, do a sort of a cha-cha-cha through a set of three steps um, before you're allowed to use it. Now, where's the three-step test for the owner of the right? Now, where, where is the limitation on his right? Where is the... Where is the right to be, uh, where is the question about uh, uh, what's normal exploitation uh, uh, for him uh, and what about normal exploitation for users? Uh, what about their legitimate interests? Uh, they're, they're, we're not talking about balancing at all. The balance is already gone <laughs> once you've already got into comparing unlike with unlike. That, so, so, so words matter. There's an asymmetry there which I think has to be rectified just in the language we use. The second point I want to make, uh, the economists uh, talked, and, I, and, and, and uh, Mr. Talbot picked them up, uh, talked about IP rights being strong, so there's strong rights and, and weak rights. Um, I, I found that also quite unhelpful uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, firstly, because uh, the rights themselves weren't further differentiated. You notice, uh, one thing I've, I've, I've noticed with economists when they start talking about strong and IP rights, the next slide is into patents. And th that was picked up on by uh, Jamie Boyce. said, well, there's something called copyrights out there which somehow don't actually fit innovation theory. You, know, you, you, you get them by accident without even asking for them. Uh, but there are all those things called trademarks. And I happen to think the trademarks are rather important in this. We're talking about transfer of technology. The major technology that you find in developing countries that's already transferred without whether they want it or not is brands. They're there. And uh, they are not time limited, as somebody talked about. I mean, here's, here's, here's the deal with IP rights, they're time limited. Uh, brands go on potentially forever. 
you just, uh, you don't even, uh, well, there's some places that you have registries, with other places you don't. So, but then you go back, to that, that's the point number one, differentiate. Secondly, uh, rights are only as strong as, the, as, 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 as they are accepted by the public. The public is uh, massively indifferent to intellectual property. Now, there's a, there's a shocking thing to say. Um, but those of those who've actually talked with uh, somebody called the public uh, find how little they know and, and, and actually how little they care. Now, it's all very well to talk about strong IP rights, but if, strong, if nobody gives a damn about them, then they're strong only in the mind of the person who believes they're strong and nobody else. So uh, there's a way to go before, before talking about strong rights in theory and strong rights on the ground. Uh, thirdly, beware of too many experts. Um, let me tell you what I th mean by that. I've got two minutes. Oh, oh. Beware of timekeepers as well. <laughs> um, uh, so I probably won't get onto harmonization, but let me make this point on, on beware of too many experts. Um, it's, it is extraordinary that, I, that, that, I, that IP has become so pervasive. Uh, and it's sometimes nice to hear, uh, it's refreshing to hear someone who's non-expert look at this and say, this, this was mad. <laughs> um, and and, and I've, I, chose, I, I, I choose for my non-expert a, a two judges of the English Court of Appeal who are sitting on a case at the end of last year in December which involved the question, amongst other things, of whether or not putting a lawyer's cease and desist letter without authority on a website constitutes a copyright infringement in the uh, either the lawyers uh, or their clients. Um, and uh, this was a summary judgment case. On, on summary judgment, the trial judge, uh, who was an expert in copyright, said, well, of course. Um, and it goes off to the Court of Appeal. Well, there are other things involved, uh, but this was a side issue. And the Court of Appeal, because of the posture of the way the, way the case went there, appallingly badly argued by intellectual property counsel, experts in the field. Uh, appallingly argued, and, and so they say, well, we've got to give you summary judgment on this, on, on, on the way you've argued it, uh, summary judgment against the defendant who'd put it up. But one of the judges said this, um, I feel considerable surprise that this can be the subject of copyright. Now, if you know how English judges talk, saying com considerable surprise means He's completely bouleversé. Uh, he's been practicing law for 45 years and copying solicitors' letters non-stop without thinking for a moment that what he was doing was wrong. Um, uh, the, the, the second judge said not only this, but he went on to say, uh, I, I was too was surprised. He dropped the word considerably because uh, that's going too far, but he, he was still uh, uh, slightly bouleversé. Uh, that, 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 that a solicitor's letter could be an original literary work. Uh, he said, although I must confess that having read some solicitor's letters, they would qualify as literary works of fiction. Um, <laughs> he went on, and I'll be very, I'll, I'll wrap up very quickly on this. He went on, he went on simply to say this, uh, the, the first conservative prize judge. If this is true, and it appears to be true, and I've looked at the cases to see this, uh, then we have to find ways around this. We have to find ways of saying, yes, there's an implied license to use it, or we have to say this is free speech under the European Convention of Human Rights. Um, beware of experts. Lord Justice Condeed needs to be there. And that's one of the problems, I think, with the Federal Circuit. You, need, you have too many experts there. You need to have the occasional Condeed sitting there who says, the emperor has no clothes if you, mix, if you don't mind me mixing the books. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's turn to Professor Martin Edelman, Director of Intellectual Property Law Program, George Washington University Law School. Uh, thank you, Keith um, and Jerry. I'm glad that uh, Jerry asked me to come here and be one of the affirmative action um, speakers, uh, because I believe in strong intellectual property rights. However, having heard uh, Jamie Boyle do a fabulous job of making fun of copyright, uh, and um, David Baver just uh, now pointing out some of the absurdities of copyright and perhaps even uh, trademarks, uh, uh, 
I thought I would limit my remarks to patent law. Uh, after all, patent law is the most important of the intellectual property fields by far. It is the field that is in most dispute and uh, has stimulated most of the arguments uh, around the world in, in terms of what it actually uh, is doing. And so the sideshow of copyright, whether it's 70 years, you know, life plus 70 or life plus 90 or life plus 50, interesting uh, issue. Maybe it has some um, uh, effect. Uh, but patents really do. Patents really affect uh, the economy. Many of you, of course, would not be here if it weren't for the patent system. I look around and see all these uh, healthy people, some uh, uh, not young, most of whom would, would be dead if it weren't for the patent system. Uh, but you will all criticize it and listen to all of the stuff for the last two days about how the world is coming to an end, alive, of course, because of the uh, noxious patent system that's running around killing uh, people. But mo I, at least I haven't seen uh, any deaths uh, so far in the last uh, uh, two days. I won't get into all, all of the developments that have gone on in my lifetime that have dramatically uh, changed the world uh, that uh, uh, I live in, uh, but um, uh, I could do that if somebody wants to uh, take me through it. Now, I hate to do this, but this class must be treated like I would treat the discussion of a patent system in a foreign country where people do not understand it very well. I do not sense an understanding of the patent system in this room. So let me bore you with the fundamentals. First of all, it's an extremely moral system. It essentially says that all of us have benefited from the developments that our ancestors have made, the generations before us. Everything essentially on file in patent offices before 1980 is in the public domain. And I can tell you, it's a lot of very good technology. Much more is in the public domain, but at least everything filed before 1980 uh, with some very, very minor exceptions. So we benefited from that. We pay during our lifetime, or 20 years, for developments that are made now. And what do we do with those developments? We give those to the next generation. So our children and our children's children will have all the work, all the inventions that are made in pick a 20-year period uh, will all be uh, in the public domain again so that the next speaker at the next conference 20 years from now, they'll even be more healthy people uh, and uh, uh, smiling people uh, at, at the conference. They certainly will be very much richer uh, than we are uh, today. Secondly, the system is moral because it's structured so that the people who benefit from this generation's inventions pay. It drives me nuts to listen to economists, who I, I've ranted about this enough, you'd think they'd learn, always talking about the consumer, the lost consumer surplus, as if the alternative system of governments paying where you have taxes and you have to tax, then you have to pay, then you have to determine how much to pay, and that has generated a whole industry of law review articles 
this thick. Many, many trees have died for a system that couldn't possibly work. But uh, that's the alternative system. The patent system is far better. It says the first cut, the people who benefit pay. After all, that is capitalism. That's what a market economy is about. So that's at least the first cut. That's a very moral decision. And the economist's attack on the patent system on that basis is simply misguided. And any time you hear it, you should just jump up and say, well, are you proposing the alternative? And if you're not, why are you even mentioning uh, this as a problem? Thirdly, the system is invariant with respect to market structure. It doesn't favor a particular market structure. You, you will read the economic literature, which rants on about how certain market structures may not need the patent system. Why? Because they're monopolies uh, or they're built-in uh, impediments to uh, copying. Well, if they're built-in impediments to the copying, the patent system doesn't hurt. But it sets up a background where if you have a competitive market structure where you have a, a lot of competitors or even a few who compete like mad, uh, that it will provide the necessary protection if properly uh, it administered. So even at that level, it's a brilliant system. In fact, it is the greatest legal invention made since the criminal law or maybe contract law, but I would suspect it's more important. We probably could get along without contract law better than we could get along without patent law if we want to be capitalists. And make no mistake about it, the attack on the patent system is an attack on capitalism because a patent system is fundamental to uh, the proper working uh, of the uh, patent system. Now let me tell you who else benefits. During the life of a patent, the patent owner cannot capture all the value given to the public. Uh, indeed, uh, you will see in many patent decisions, the court will say, no, we can't extend the scope of the claims to what you have in effect given to us, which is a program to do research. In other words, many patents will suggest research avenues, but those cannot be uh, captured under I existing doctrine. So not only do you get uh, the whole thing after 20 years, do you get the use of it with a payment, of course, uh, during the 20-year period, but uh, the, the uh, scientists and, and people who work in the area are given uh, clues uh, to uh, the, the... No, I see that, Jerry, one minute uh, remaining. You think the patent system is only worth a minute? Uh, uh, that's one of the... That's one, uh, one of the problems... <laughs> one of the problems with the, this conference that he thinks the patent system is worth a minute. Uh, let me, uh, just in, in that minute, uh, smash antitrust. Uh, this, is, and we could go into this, we could go to the misuse doctrine, which is the biggest misuse uh, of, of all. It, the, the antitrust doctrine was smashed in the United States against student gesellschaft 20 years ago by the D.C. Circuit, before the Federal Circuit, the bete noire of the academics is the Federal Circuit, which had to fix up the massive screw-ups of the brilliant court, the Supreme Court, and the various regional courts. Had done such a bad job that something had to be done. But, uh, but now we've forgotten that after uh, 20 years, so we, we criticize the Federal Circuit, which does. It, uh, we could spend some time on some decisions that are goofy. Um, do I have any more time? Uh, no. Out of time now? Way over. 
Way, way over time. Uh, but even this, the most way, important way, subject way that we're discussing. Yeah, way, way patent way over. The patent extension <laughs> has expired. Um, <laughs> Let's take a couple of questions or comments. I, I, I did not really think that the patent system was under attack here. I did think it was the line drawing exercise. And so I take it that you think that everything is, uh, is wonderful in the best of all possible worlds. Uh, I think that the discussion of the patent system here was very, very uh, juvenile. There is uh, uh, this general idea that the patent system is just expanding. Uh, Anybody knows that hasn't read patent decisions. Uh, uh, the, uh, let's take biotech. We have uh, a doctrine called the description doctrine, which is a mistaken creation, actually, of Alan Lurie on the federal circuit that is greatly narrowed, uh, and wrongly so, uh, some uh, biotech uh, uh, patents. There's been a major attack, in, in my view, rightly so, on the doctrine of equivalence. And there's been a substantial narrowing. There's been a substantial narrowing in terms of scope of claims and claim interpretation uh, by, by the federal circuit. So this notion, oh, we've had this steady drumbeat of expansion, is just wrong. Then you could go and read what some of the English judges have said. And, it, and England is a very important country for forming uh, IP uh, decisions. I'll take you now to the German Supreme Court, uh, where uh, the German Supreme Court has rendered recently uh, narrowing uh, decisions. Indeed, the only country where you've had a serious expansion is in Japan, not due to trips, but because Japan has decided rightly, I would say, that they should have a stronger patent system. Now, we saw a presentation about this, except the person didn't know what a strong patent system was. But, but I didn't have time to deal with uh, that. But lately, they have strengthened their patent system, including having a real damage provision and uh, modifying the court structure so that cases won't take 10 years or, or, or more. So there's a major, a major strengthening of the patent system uh, in, in Japan. But otherwise, I've answered your question, Jerry, and, you're, and uh, I'm done. Uh, let me just say as an economist that uh, I find it curious that we are simultaneously thought to think too little and too much of the patent system. So no one wants to hear about that, but we're all also always asked what we think about these issues. So it's a, an interesting place to be. Let's move on to uh, Peter Gerhardt, professor, uh, Case Western Law School. Thank you. Uh, I hope that Jerry and Keith uh, feel well thanked for all the thanks they've gotten at this conference because uh, it's been a ritual to get up here and thank them. And I, I too, thank them. I'm one of those who was happy to be brought to you by the patent system. It didn't <laughs> work. <clears throat> what I'd like, to, I'd like to shift, shift focus if I could. Um, uh, what I want to do is take two threads that have worked through these three days and see if I can't combine them. The first thread is the question of... Um, institutional design. Uh, how do we think about designing an international institution um, that meets the needs of the international intellectual property system? That is, how do we know what players to invite to the system? What do we know what sort of norms to set up in order to have the system work? What incentives do we expect the people to be under and what restraints do we expect them to be under? That has been a consistent theme. I want to combine that with a, with a separate theme that's been running through, and that is the question of what, are, what distributive values are given to us by the intellectual property system. How do we combine a, an interest in distributive values with an interest in institution building? Now, obviously, the, the topics are combined because what we get out of an institution depends upon how we design it. So if we want distributive values to be built into the international intellectual property system, we have to design institutions uh, that do that. And my quest uh, in a short seven minutes is to suggest some ways in which we might enhance dis distributional values in the international intellectual uh, property system. And what I want to do is start by recognizing that in every intellectual property <coughs> system, there are distributive values. 
Uh, we often think of, of the intellectual property issue of how much incentive do we need to get a certain amount of innovation or a certain amount of research. But the incentive question, how much incentive we need, is a separate one from who should pay the incentive. <clears throat> that is, how should we allocate the, the burden of providing the incentive, which is, a, is I call it, a distributive um, issue. And I, I raise that in a couple of ways. Obviously, uh, the option of having a prize system or a subsidy system uh, means that the, the, that the burdens of the incentive are distributed among taxpayers, not, am not among consumers, whereas the property rights system has a dis diff different distributional outcome. Um, but I want to make two points. One is that distributional value is, are embedded in the intellectual property system uh, because the access rights are often dependent or often encourage use by those who don't have the opportunity to pay for the use. Uh, we didn't, it wasn't inevitable that we had a copyright system that encouraged lending libraries, and I would, I would posit that as, an, as a distributional value built into the copyright system. Moreover, the, the intellectual property system is not separate from the social system in which countries make laws. It is, Im, it, it is embedded in a system in which countries can provide social uh, services network in which they can have transfer payments and in which the access for the poor is often embedded in social policy, not through the intellectual property system, but um, outside the intellectual property system. And I'm sure that many of you can name uh, a dozen government programs that provides access to the system for the poor from the taxpayers rather than from uh, the recipients. I think we've seen three different kinds of distribution, what I will call distributional issues raised over the three days. And I want to highlight those and talk a little bit about how we organize to provide those. The first distributional issue is we have when there are exchanges, that is when countries are exchanging uh, legal rights and obligations, which is, after all, the WTO model. How are, how are the benefits, how are the benefits to be achieved from that exchange to be distributed between the parties? That is, it's not inevitable <clears throat> that the benefits are fairly distributed. And what we've seen in this conference is a number of people who've said no, that some of the characteristics of the WTO system do not result in a fair distribution of the benefits of the WTO exchange. Uh, we've had talk about capacity and knowledge, inability to predict the, fu to predict the future, <laughs> misalignment of a country's real goals with the uh, goals of its leaders, uh, bargaining over status gains versus over dynamic gains. And then we've had a series of antidotes, and, and many of you are working on bringing more balance into the WTO system so that when there is this exchange, the benefits of the exchange are more closely balanced. And I want to suggest that when I heard the presentation about the difference between property rules and liability rules, one of the things that occurred to me is that one of the differences between the different sets of rules is how the exchange between the owner and the user are divided, that the property system weights the exchange in favor of the owner, whereas the liability system is really set up to have a different distribution of the benefits. So that's the first kind of distribution. The second uh, kind of distribution uh, issue that has been here is how do we distribute the cost of public goods? That is, we know we want a lighthouse. We don't have a uh, government that's going to um, help us decide how to distribute who's going to pay for the lighthouse. What we have is a, is a group of beneficiaries of the lighthouse, and we're going to go to them and ask uh, them to help allocate the burdens of building the lighthouse. An extremely difficult uh, problem internationally when we have no central uh, process for redistributing uh, income. And I think here we have to go back to Robert Cohane's notion on the very first day that when you're engaging in a public goods uh, discussion of how to divide the, the burdens of providing the public, good, public goods and you have no government process, you really have to very carefully set up the institutions in order to make sure that the norms are decided before you decide the application of the norms so that there's a buy-in on the norms that constrains and guides the application. Finally, of course, the third distribution issue is the hardest of all, and that is what do you do when people don't have access to the system because they are too poor? Uh, and we live, of course, in an era of globalization where we have no process for dealing with that. And that's what we're struggling with, with, with essential medicines. Um, 
how do we reconstruct on top of this system that does not redistribute wealth a system of making transfer payments? I think we saw the same thing in technology transfer. Because to me, the, the issue there was on technology transfer is how do we build capacity to accept the, the transfer? And that has to be a, a notion of some transfer payment. Uh, now, this is, a, this is the hardest issue of globalization, of, of, of <laughs> building not only efficiency, but also some distributive rights in. And as an academic, I claim the right to be in the ivory tower and spin out some ideas that have no practical meaning now, but may have some resonance um, in the future. One, one way we do it, of course, is by crypto. I like the word crypto. It's become sort of our theme for this conference. Crypto redistribution. Um, Article 66.2 is the transfer of technology, um, which is an, is an attempt to get the rich countries to build the capacity of the poor countries. And that is a redistributive act if we could make it work. And that, of course, is, is, an, is, is an institutional design program. Uh, but what I'm thinking of is a process um, by which we have redistribution by it's beginning to think about taxing the gains from efficiency and using that as a pool of money. And I want to use um, Professor Barton's global patent to illustrate the point. What, what, what John Barton was doing was, was building efficiencies into the global patent system by reducing the cost. And quite rightly, that is a goal we ought to uh, achieve. What he didn't address is who gets those efficiencies, to whom are those efficiencies delivered. I don't think he assumed that the efficiencies go to the property owners or go to the innovators. I think what he was doing was saying, if we build more efficiencies into the patent system, what we can then do is heighten the bar and increase the experimental use. So we give on the one hand and, and take on the other. And of course, the theme of my talk is that, that the decision of who should benefit from those efficiencies is a separate question from how do we get the efficiencies. So now my proposal, why not tax the efficiencies? That is that when, when we have a global patent system that increases the return to inventiveness, why don't we tax some of that return and use that as a fund from which we can then um, provide access for those whose denial of access is because of their poverty. Uh, we, we really can't, I think, expect globalization to thrive and move forward unless we are able to build into our efficiency-based globalized system some mechanisms of redistribution. Thank you. Yeah, go right ahead. We'll move right on to Professor Hugh Hanson, Fordham University School of Law. Thank you. Uh, first, let me say, Jerry, this is a fantastic conference. I mean, incredible quality and uh, very interesting, very thought provoking. All right. Comments, where should I start? Well, first is with the name of the conference, Public Good. One, I don't think intellectual property is a public good. I don't think it's non-rivalrous. I mean, you take it, you let someone else use it, it automatically becomes a non-exclusive right, changes the nature of the right, diminishes its value. If you had a car and they say, okay, you work, we're gonna be able to let someone else use your car during the day, you say, hold on, hold on, that's my car. So there's some sort of psychic value, one to uh, exclusivity, and there's also financial value. Someone else using a car is gonna diminish the value of it if you resell it. Same thing with intellectual property. You don't longer have an exclusive, diminishes the value. I don't think you can call that non-rivalrous. Commons, all this commons, commons, this commons, and there's so many commons. Where to start? I think commons is interesting. If it's meant to say what should be, that's one thing, but if it's meant really as a word that's supposed to reflect what we've all thought about common use of things, I think it's uh, deceptive. If we go back to Concord, you know, in the early days, uh, the common, there wasn't any commons. The only commons there was was this little area of town. I said, don't touch that. But because everyone else was just taking the commons and using it. And look at Thoreau. He was out there in his little cabin. If someone came up to him and said, HD, HD is what his friends called him. HD, you don't own this common. Uh, you don't own this thing. It, it is it's part of the forest common or of the too close to the pond common or whatever common. I don't think it would go anywhere. If, and then if a sheriff came and tried to dispossess him, I think you'd see real civil disobedience. It just was not in the concept that the commons was an area no one could, with effort, use and create private property. I think it actually was just the opposite. Information commons. Did we really have any information commons? The first Copyright Act was maps, charts, and books. 
maps and charts, if you could have anything more antithetical to the information commons, it's putting copyright protection in charts and maps, especially ones that are already in existence. And as we know, once you give copyright protection to things that are information commons, it dries up and, and you don't have it anymore. The public domain is gone. It's really kind of a miracle that we were all able to get to Duke with all this copyright protection for maps for so long. What about other things? What about the science commons? Well, does anyone really believe that? Universities and research scientists are in a rush to the patent office. What about cultural? What about genetic resources commons? We tell that a tribe in Papua New Guinea that, no, 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 too bad, you can't have it. I happen to support very much traditional rights, but you'd have to tell them, no, that's part of the commons. And by the way, if you wanted something, you know, even if you do give something, we can't give you more than life plus 50, because only evil people like Disney want more than life plus 50, so we'd have to limit it to life plus 50, and I don't think they'd go along with that. Uh, so I think that. Now, Jamie Boyle had a talk yesterday on copyright, which obviously David agreed with, and Marty, uh, influence. You take Marty one inch out of patents and he's defenseless. So, I mean, the, 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 the Jamie Boyle talk, I have to say, almost didn't agree with anything of it. Now, whether, whether that, well, we'll see. First of all, he said that copyright is a relatively strong monopoly. Copyright's not even a teeny weeny monopoly. Monopoly is the power to exclude or control prices. Copyright doesn't give you that at all. Copyright is an ownership term. I own this chair. You don't say I have a monopoly in a Chair, I own it. I own this work. Ownership is different than monopoly. It's a misuse of the term of monopoly, especially calling it relatively strong. And then he said it was accidental, as if this is supposed to mean like people don't care about it. Well, all property other than patents is accidental because it comes about by operational law. That doesn't mean people don't care about it, they don't cherish it. And if you're going to pick any right of which you're going to call as accidental, the worst one to pick is copyright, which people become, like me, very emotional about. Um, you talk to any creator in the real world, I suppose, there are, I, I, I take away the sort of software uh, internet crowd who maybe ownership doesn't matter at all. But the, real, the rest of the world, a different real world, authors, they treat copyright as if it's their children. It's not accidental. It's a natural right. You have to actually dissuade them. They don't have total control about it under the law. Um, this, here we are in what I would call what I've officially designated Commons Central. Uh, and you, you people have come in, and you signed a little thing at the beginning. I bet you wouldn't have signed it if you get exclusive rights to this accidental copyright to Duke. No. You'd have been crossing off first North American. You've been writing in all these things. Why? Because it value, it's a value to it. I even saw <clears throat> in a number of papers that said, don't quote. I said, oh my god, they're taking away my fair use right. I wasn't mad, I was just a little disappointed. But et to the academy. So what are we talking about here? We're, we're, we're treating things which you treat seriously as if they don't count, they're just accidental, and I think that, that's wrong. And what about the example of the internet? All these 12 people using this poem. That is the way it works. There really isn't a problem with the internet for any degree. People just use things. If you go on the internet and you say, I can't find any copyright material because people couldn't clear the right, you're looking in the wrong places. Basically, people do use it. It's efficient, they do use it. Now, when these people were notified, it wasn't a demand letter, cease and demand letter, but the, what did they think? Oh yeah, you know what, maybe somebody owns this, maybe we shouldn't use it without permission. That's what we want. We want people to respect other people's rights. That wasn't a bad reaction, that was a good reaction that most people have when they were aware that maybe someone else owns something. And then what's the big deal about having to clear rights? You know, Pam Samuelson, uh, I like Pam Samuelson, I think at one time she liked me. Uh, <laughs> came and asked, strange as it may seem to some of you, she asked the permission to use one of my, uh, an article in uh, some teaching materials. I was thrilled. I didn't say bugger off, Pam. I was thrilled to allow it. Most people are going to give rights. And those people, a few that require money or whatever, then you make your choice just like anything else. Do you want to buy it or not want to buy it or anything else? If the worst comes to the worst, you have to create something, uh, which isn't so bad when you're preparing materials. So I think the the Jamie Boyle approach, one is I don't think it reflects reality. I think it diminishes as accidental something that's important to a lot of people. Uh, and, it, and it states copyright is a strong monopoly when all it is is just basically a property right. Final topic, antitrust. Eleanor Fox was saying, why do we have, saying basically it looks grim if you're looking to diminish intellectual property rights with um, Antitrust laws are competition law. Well, they were diminished for many years. Warren Antitrust 
EU in the beginning. Why was it? Not because of economic analysis, because in the United States of social political analysis, basically a populist approach. Brandeis's book, The Curse of Bigness. Big was bad. EU, the same thing. Germany, post-war, Nazis. The Nazis were able to have power because of big business colluded with the Nazis. So big is bad. And then they went over in the 50s to the U.S. Supreme Court to see what they did. So they combined and you had a, a view that was socially driven, not economically driven. When that view diminished, as it did, when the people who believed in that, that big is necessarily bad in a multinational world, it's going to be difficult to believe that completely, especially governments, what happened? There was no economic theory to fall back on. The Chicago School and the moderate Chicago School took over. The real crucial period for antitrust were the 80s, of which a number of things happened. When you had Baxter from Stanford take over Antitrust Division, who was the law and economics close to Chicago School, you had the Federal Circuit created. Everyone in Congress viewed the Warren Court approach to patents as antithetical to innovation, including Ted Kennedy. Very strong push that you had to make patents more important. And then in the Supreme Court, you had Diamond v. Deere, Diamond v. Chakrabarty. It's sort of, and a number of cases which, which limited Sears and Comco. So you had to sort of turn around completely. And since then, you've had a fairly consistent approach to strong protection. EU's competition law is changing to where it's more sympathetic to IP. So the trend is going uh, in that direction. Why? I think it's because most people don't view this as strange users rights. Most people view the simple thing as this. You have effort into something, you should be able to protect it. What you create from people who would free ride or compete with you and maybe other people fair use of something not. And that is what basically drives our law and drives most IP law. And most people, juries, trial judges, other judges, go along with that. That's really the key. And until you can change that view, which I think is fairly strong, uh, there are going to be a lot of conferences with people just upset with what's going on. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much. Hey, uh, hey, just, uh, 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 yeah. he just was, uh, I want to thank you very much for uh, uh, your strong defense of the copyright system. As for the strong defense of the patent system, what you can see from this uh, is that uh, these questions are very polarized, very uh, polarized, and it sometimes makes discussion difficult. I do want, because Jamie Boyle is not here, uh, I do want to point out that um, he is uh, uh, an author uh, of uh, creative works. He's a very strong believer in the copyright system, as is uh, David Lang, as is all of us who are also creative authors on the side. And uh, 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 we're not really waiving our rights. I do think that all of us, as with the patent system, all of us have some very, very grave doubts about um, the, uh, uh, the extension and the direction and the movement beyond what was the uh, classical system, uh, and I don't think when you talk about authors, anybody uh, only a few years ago would have been talking about computer programs. So I do thank you, at least, for not insinuating that people that have some doubts about the expansion of both systems are subversive anti-capitalists and should be sh shot on sight. I thank you <laughs> for that good taste. Uh, can I uh, uh, move on? You want to introduce the next? Uh, uh, are you suggesting I'm wrong, Jerry? <laughs> <laughs> because I want to defend myself. Well, well I've had your chance. Uh, I think, I think, you see, you see strong the, capitalist views are immediately cut off. I think at the end of the panel we'll have uh, time for a few questions, and I know there's one important intervention at least. But let's turn uh, to the next panelist. Jeff Tansey was going to be giving a paper, but he couldn't make it, so, so Peter Drehos will, uh, will try to present it in his stead. Peter? Um, Thank you very much. Je Jeff Tanzi uh, asked me to uh, present the paper on his behalf and with his agreement uh, I will, rather than read the paper, summarise the key themes and um, quote from the paper to illustrate the themes. Uh, th there were some jokes in here in the initial draft at, at my expense, so I've deleted those. Um, <coughs> side payments really do work. Um, Jeff comes to this as an outsider. Um, he points out in the paper that it was his work on the food system uh, made him realise the importance of intellectual property in uh, uh, underpinning modern biotechnology. And it was also um, his involvement uh, with, British, with the British Quakers um, that led him to um, become more and more concerned about the impact of intellectual property on, on people and the environment. Now, there are three themes in Jeff's paper. 
The first theme is that of processual um, unfairness. And in a sense, he suggests that unfairness, processual unfairness, sows the seeds of its own destruction. His second theme is that we need a better language to describe the reality of what is happening um, in both national and the world systems. And his third theme is the need to democratise the policy process that underpins intellectual property uh, standard setting. So let me um, quickly turn to the first theme, that is uh, this notion that the processes that underpin intellectual property are somehow unfair. And here I quote from his paper, the Quakers have a long-standing commitment to non-violence, peace and justice, and a history of mediation in disputes. Their work on TRIPS grew from a program dealing with genetic resources. Initially, this aimed to help ensure that the countries of Southern Africa played an effective part in the negotiations to revise the international undertaking on plant genetic resources. The focus was not on the positions they should take, but, they should, uh, but that they should be a full part of the process. This is based on Quaker experience in conflict resolution. This shows that agreements reached by very unequal partners or in ways where one side feels considerably disadvantaged or dominated, tend to sow the seeds of future disputes and conflict. He then goes on to talk a little bit more about the kinds of problems that basic unfairness creates and the sort of destabilising effects that that has. So let me just let, read to you what he says about trust. More developing... Um, Developing countries face continued pressures in bilateral and other multilateral arenas to go beyond what was already agreed to in TRIPS in WTO. The sense of injustice this leaves behind, not to mention the feelings of bad faith generated by subsequent experience in trying to address developing country concerns in health, has undermined trust in the WTO as a multilateral institution in which the interests of developing countries and their peoples can be taken sufficiently into account. Okay, so that's all I would like to read from his paper on the first theme. Let me now turn to his second theme, which was the need to use uh, language to more accurately describe the reality of what is happening in the world system. Here I begin to quote, this takes me to my second point, the need to change the language we use to talk about intellectual property. Just in the way feminists did about gender, we need to change the language to reflect more nearly the reality of what is happening. Then we will be better able to have a debate that balances public and private interests and one into which more people will feel able to enter. He then goes on to issue a plea for a more privileged-based way of talking about intellectual property. And he argues that this more privileged-based way of talking will enable us to see more clearly the social contract that underpins intellectual property right, and so that we can have a better, more um, enriched discussion about the nature of this contract and how this contract needs to keep the balance right. That's all I wish to say about the second theme. Now let me turn to the third theme, the need to democratise the policy processes that underpin the standard setting agenda. And here I quote, Finally, we also need to ensure a much broader involvement of a wide range of people and interests in making the rules that create monopoly privileges. For while intellectual property might be full of legal and technical questions, at heart it is not a legal and technical matter, but one that affects the relations between us all as human beings. It affects our access to and ability to share knowledge, medicines, food, music, and a whole host of other things. And the rules that we as societies invent, for they are truly inventions, 
can help constrain or liberate the human spirit and human life. Therefore, they must be drawn up with wide public participation and recognition of public interests, today's and future generations, and enhance the development capacity of the poor and excluded. So he then goes on to elaborate on this need to democratise the policy process. And with that, I conclude. Tansi's group was really instrumental in uh, getting the funding and putting together the help uh, of the people in working on the access to medicines question. They've made a fantastic contribution, and they deserve all our praise for that. Uh, Gustavo? Uh, Gustavo Guidini, um, Professor of Intellectual Property at uh, Luis University in Rome. Thank you, of course, for your kind invitation. As I told uh, Jerry, instead of delivering uh, just a personal opinion in a few minutes, I would like, uh, on the subject of developing countries' access to essential medicines, give, convey an information that uh, illustrates uh, uh, a novel approach, or maybe a novel approach, of the European community on the balance between public goods and private interests, uh, as reflected by a very, very recent uh, March 25th, uh, 203, document 7722 bar 03, proposal for a council regulation to avoid trade diversion into the European Union of certain key medicines. It follows the 15 March 201 resolution of the European Parliament on access to drugs for HIV AIDS victims in developing countries. Um, Mm, the proposal, in order to encourage the pharmaceutical producers to make available products at strongly reduced prices in significantly, in significantly increased volumes, basically outlines enforcement by the member states' custom authorities aimed to grant adequate protection against the risk of reimport into the community of drugs, patented and non-patented, supplied at strongly reduced prices to one or more of the 72 countries listed in uh, Annex 2 to this proposal. Uh, countries of all the five continents, one even in Europe, Moldova. Um, to facilitate the enforcement, easy recognition of the drugs sold, uh, um, measures of easy recognition of the drugs sold to developing countries are foreseen, including a common permanent logo, uh, as in uh, Annex 5, slide 2. Um, the, in order to qualify for the special protection, manufacturers must agree to sell the essential drugs at low prices, benchmarked quite unconvincingly to me, that's a, probably the worst uh, part of the, to the seller's profit, Alternatively, at the seller's option, at a price no higher than 20% on the market price of the drugs in the OECD countries, or with a maximum margin of 10% on the manufacturer's direct production cost. Now, and as far as the proposal allows, the drugs thus sold to one of the more li listed countries can freely circulate within all these said countries as if in a sort of transcontinental common market of the have-nots. Only they cannot be re-exported into any country of the EC. Finally, to the subject, on the subject of uh, patented drugs, uh, the proposal states that the regulation shall not interfere and will respect the intellectual property rights and the rights of intellectual property owners. This means, accordingly to, to, to the first first glance comment that I could uh, uh, gather, um, of course, uh, with a caveat of uh, very few days to, 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 to reflect and understand, this, uh, according to these comments, means that the exclusive powers of production and distribution at first commercial stage are maintained. Uh, of course, as, we, as, I say, as I will say, this provision does not preempt, of course, the subjection of IPRs to the overall regime of TRIPS. But um, um, in these first comments, it is uh, 
um, it has been understood that uh, the U European community is, is making a sort of a shift uh, to a solution different and alternative, at, at least as first best, vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, different from the commonly envisaged solutions based on compulsory licenses and government use. Um, seems to, to, to think that uh, to overcome the current impasse, a, a cooperative involvement of uh, the patentees is sought, offering them not the threat of compulsory licenses, but incentives, uh, protection against rain ports, and uh, protection of all other patent-related faculties except the one to freely fix the price above the um, regulated margin in, in order to achieve uh, the overall goal of, for, yes, uh, uh, first of all, price, but not only price, but also guaranteeing that the drugs sold to, to the developing country being of exactly the same quality as the original one, the patented one, and uh, guaranteeing also uh, expertise uh, in, uh, in, uh, in order um, of the modes and, and ways of uh, professional and medically um, uh, sustainable um, and, and, and medically professional uh, administration of drugs which are very complex to administer and, 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 and monitor. Um, in, in, in thus, the, the proposal seems uh, to, 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 to think that uh, um, compulsory licenses and government use may be a second best. Those measures would remain applicable either to patentees who should not adhere to this European deal, new deal or those who will accept it, but in this case for reasons other than price regulation. And as an example, the need to expand price regulation to drugs aimed to other diseases than HIV, malaria, and tuberculosis, or to remedy to possible insufficient supply of low price drugs. It is very early, to, of course, at least to me, to assess whether this proposal uh, will uh, represent uh, uh, first start to a workable solution. It uh, reflects a compromise, probably still not well balanced between producers and consumers of the DC, but still it uh, represents um, a strong, uh, at least uh, so it is interpreted, a strong hint uh, in, in the direction of seeking cooperative involvement of the concerned industries in the solution of the humanitarian goal. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. On that constructive uh, uh, contribution, we uh, are constrained to end. I know that uh, because our time is really up. I know that we have a, a comment, uh, Susan. I'm, I'm sorry, we're not going to be able to, to 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 give you the time, but I would like you to just be able to have a minute to state your. Uh, the, the theme that you were going to make. We're not going to be able to go over it because some people have desperately to leave. Uh, so if you could just uh, uh, maybe uh, state the, the theme and put a, a marker out there for what you would have done if you'd had the five minutes that we simply can't give you. Okay. Um, well, I guess, you know, I just, I mean, this is an issue that I've been saying, talking in, since September about as having being, I think, of something when I met with you in September in, in uh, Washington as being important. But I also appreciate that time has, has run out, and I think if people read the international treaty, they might see the tortured language and think, why would we want anybody involved with the legal research behind that uh, talking at a conference, because the language is tortured. My concern was probably twofold. Um, one, the treaty one, that people may not have, did you all get the treaty, the treaty you're referring to? Just the international treaty on plant genetic resources that Larry was outlining okay. for us yesterday. Um, I work for the International Plant Genetic Resources, and we're one of the 16 centers that You've heard Michael Blackney talking about and Larry talking about yesterday holding plant genetic resources in trust for the world community. So there was talk yesterday and the day before about biopiracy. So I wanted to correct some misinformation about that for two reasons. One, specifically, it's incorrect about our centers. And two, because our centers have been working for many years to dispel the general myth about biopiracy 
as it uh, relates to plant genetic resources for food and agriculture. Because our belief is in, it, it is the response and the mistrust that has grown out of that that is actually threatening the public domain, the global commons in genetic resources, as now we see has been created in an international legal uh, agreement. Because the threats aren't just coming from intellectual property rights, they're also coming uh, from access uh, regulations, which are also a second kind of enclosure movement. And those access regulations are in response to the intellectual property rights. And you know, we have worked very hard to create an agreement uh, and, a, and a multilateral system, which is not a bundle of bilateral transactions. And there were just a lot of points, I think, that were not very clear yesterday about that. And in just briefly, just in terms of the list that Michael had put up about biopiracy, first of all, we, we give out probably 200,000 or 400,000 samples every year under a material transfer agreement, which requires that no intellectual property rights be taken out on the material. And if you transfer it to a third party, you also will not take out intellectual property rights out on that. These materials uh, that we have are usually duplicated in other collections, and they, also, they exist in other places. So the biopiracy, uh, they, these resources, only one of the ones listed from Michael actually came directly from our centers. Though our centers may actually then put forward to say, we'd like someone to re-examine that patent, even though it didn't <coughs> come from us, because we think that's original material. So the patent system, or the plant variety protection system, is actually making a mistake. The one case where I do know that the material did come from our centers was handled absolutely appropriately and was sent out with a material transfer agreement. And the Australian PVP granted a right that was incorrect. Uh, so, but the, I think the major point I would want to make is the centers are giving out uh, most, most of the germplasm flow from the centers are going to developing countries. A developing country for every one accession they put in the center is getting anywhere from 60 to 200 back. And that the, you know, the, bio, the biopiracy is, I think, not really what's happening. And even if there are very few cases where, in fact, that may have happened, you're talking about, I mean, we're having an amazing success rate when you think about the number of things that are going out with these material uh, transfer agreements and the number of mistakes that are happening. And if you know people are running a red light, are you going to then put a policeman at every corner? How do you spend your resources? So, I mean, I, I can't do it justice. But but thank you. Thank you for the clarification. Let me just point out that uh, uh, our speaker had seven minutes on that <laughs> issue, and you raised a lot of issues. And what it tells us is we should have given more time for the discussion of that issue, but we had so many other issues. We need to involve some so, people that are, are on the ground doing, actually, with the negotiations of the treaties. I think that would be helpful to get a reality check on how some of this is, in fact, happening. Thank you. Um, uh, there was one uh, uh, point that was uh, uh, that our uh, history of science uh, professor wanted to raise, and the question I take it was: Is she still with us? Have we? Yes. You want to? I don't think we'll be, the answer would take another conference, but I think you just want to, if you would, phrase your question so that we can all take it home and think about it at least. Um, yes. Thank you. I'm a historian of science in the history department. Um, I'm actually working with Dan Kaplis, who's working on a long history of intellectual property rights and patent animal <coughs> at Yale that I think we should all know about and watch for it in a couple of years when it comes out. Um, the, the question I had um, was maybe better raised at the beginning, and um, I'm not an economist, I'm not a lawyer, um, which probably is the reason for my question, but maybe it's a heads up for um, clarity that could be made for dealing with outsiders like myself, and it has to do with I'm seeing three different de definitions. One, the public good, which I don't think is even a question of this conference. Um, but in the mind of an outsider, it gets conflated with a public good, um, which is different from the thing, from the public goods, plural. Um, and I think this question was actually started to be raised by one of the panelists um, this morning, which I was glad to see. Um, but given my request for distinguishing among these three sections, then I ask myself, what, what's an international public good as that's different from a national public good? If, if it's not rivalrous, if you can't make a profit off of it, what's it doing in the international <coughs> sector at all? And I'm wondering if the question isn't rather the international issues associated with maybe national public good or the nation. Um, again, I don't think I made myself very clear, but 
just from, from the historian's perspective, what what an a good, what some goods, and what he good mean is, um, is something that would be helpful for the reading. Well, I think with that, we'll uh, bring the conference to a close. Uh, we want to thank everyone for coming and making these uh, stellar contributions. Uh, we'll be in touch about publication, I'm sure. Could, so I, uh, could I take the privilege of the, my, my indigenous community, the person to the right of the chair gets to thank the chair <coughs> for putting together, bringing us together and, and here. all yeah, the yeah. hard work. And